Okay, let me kick things off since it's the top of the hour, and let me welcome you all to the Future Trends Forum. My name is Brian Alexander. I'm the forum's creator, I'm your host, I'm your cat herder, and your guide to the next hour of conversation about the future of higher education. Well, this is all about a session on academic mergers. What happens when two or more colleges and universities combine, either as an acquisition or as a brand new synthesis? We've been seeing rising numbers of these over the past couple of years, and perhaps we'll see even more. Now to speak with you about all of this, uh, I'd like to invite Kevin Quigley to the stage. Uh, Kevin was the president of Marlboro College in Vermont, and he saw Marlboro through a very, very significant merger. I'd like him to be here to answer all your questions about how do mergers actually work? What is their purpose? What is their cost? What is their benefit? And will we see more and more of these? So without any further ado, let me welcome Dr. Kevin Quigley to the stage. Hello. <laughs> Hey, Brian. Hey, Brian. Great okay. to be here with everybody. Well, I'm glad to see you. Where are you today? I'm up in uh, Woodstock, Vermont. So oh, uh, it, it's hot and humid up here, but it's uh, God's country also. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I, I don't think anyone really appreciates summer like Vermonters. Yeah. Well, welcome. I, you know, Kevin, when I when I ask people to introduce themselves, um, I do it in a specific way. I ask people to explain what they're going to be working on for the upcoming year. You know, what projects and what ideas are going to be top of mind. So what does the next year look like for you? Great. Well, Brian, first let me say what a pleasure it is to be here with, with uh, everybody. Uh, and, and also uh, the format you have to make this a conversation is uh, incredibly appealing. I think uh, a lot of us have listened to or participated in presentations on this topic, but to have a conversation is, is really a treat. So I look forward to that. So uh, in, in ordinary times, Brian, I'd say uh, this year I, w I was gonna work on uh, three things, but in our uh, extraordinary times, I, uh, I'm gonna say, I hope to work on three things. And one with, <laughs> with my uh, colleagues at Dutch or a small Vermont based higher ed consulting firm. Uh, mm -hmm. We'd like to work with a couple of higher ed institutions that want to navigate, uh, want some help navigating a partnership process or want some help in figuring out a, a much more sustainable uh, model for their, their uh, institution. Uh, wow. Two, uh, I, I have a Fulbright uh, to work with eight provincial universities in Northern Thailand. Wow. I've got a long history there as a Peace Corps volunteer, uh, Fulbrighter before I did my dissertation research on Thailand, but it's to work with uh, eight provincial universities uh, to prepare for the coming consolidation in higher ed there. Mm. Uh, 40 years ago, Thailand had uh, 26 institutions of higher ed. Today it has 320. And, and their demographic cliff uh, yeah. for uh, the college age cohort is. is uh, it's just frightening. It, it makes uh, New England uh, look look good in comparison. And the third thing I hope to be doing is some more teaching. I just uh, finished teaching a course on democracy for a startup university in Myanmar, and uh, the leadership wow. of that university, who I've been coaching this last year, had to flee the country because they get yeah. support from the West, from George Soros and other progressive philanthropists. So. Uh, they asked me to uh, pinch it and teach a course on democracy, which seemed very timely, as you can imagine, in a place like Myanmar that just had a military coup back in February. So mm -hmm. those are my three hope to do this year. <laughs> wow, that's an, that's an awful lot. And uh, I, I've got to ask, in uh, December or January, do you ever feel like it'd be better to relocate to Southeast Asia? Well, uh, you know, I, uh, my... Uh, uh, life's interest is really revolved around uh, Southeast Asia, and uh, I'd love to spend more time there, though with the COVID situation out of mm -hmm. control for a variety mm -hmm. of reasons. That's why I said I don't know if I, I'll be able to do this Fulbright project uh, this year or next year, or yeah. you know, who knows. They're just starting to roll out the vaccines in places like uh, Vietnam and, and mm -hmm. Thailand, and Indonesia is, is apparently the new mm -hmm. India in yeah. terms of uh, the yeah. COVID pandemic. 
Well, that's a, that looks like an extraordinary year ahead, and uh, I would love to uh, uh, follow your progress and, and learn about Great. it, especially Great. that, Glad uh, to do that. Yeah. the consolidation in Thailand. That's that's yeah. really amazing to think yeah. about. Um, uh, fr um, friends, the uh, I, I have a couple of quick questions to ask uh, uh, our guest. Uh, the Future Transform is about you, and so I would love to hear your questions and your thoughts. So as we proceed, uh, as Kevin submits to my ruthless interrogation, <laughs> please think of what you'd like to ask uh, about his experience uh, in Marlboro, uh, perhaps about the projects he just described involving uh, Thailand and Myanmar, or perhaps about where you think mergers may be headed in higher education. Uh, so just just really quickly to begin with, Kevin, let me ask, what, what led Marlboro to seek to merge with another institution? No. So um, for, for Marlboro, it was really the, the kind of the uh, unholy combination of, of declining enrollment and uh, declining uh, net student revenue mm. Uh, mm. And, and all the things attendant with that uh, increasing discount rate, uh, ever larger draws on our endowment. We're fortunate uh, Marlboro had an endowment, but the ever larger draws on the endowment uh, and uh, operating uh, deficits that were ever larger. Yeah. Uh, and it, it takes a while um, because when you look at a lot of uh, small liberal arts colleges uh, like uh, Marlboro, mm -hmm. they experienced uh, some significant challenges around the Great Recession. Most of them began to recover in, if not 2010, uh, 2011. Uh, but a group of them uh, continue to, on this downward trajectory, uh, which I think for many of us, uh, sentiment and aspiration for the future prevented us to really understand the consequences of continuation of these trends around declining enrollment and ever increasing operating deficits. Just a, a, a quick question about that. You mentioned uh, not just declining revenue, but specifically declining per student revenue. Yeah. Uh, did that mean that you were increasing the discount rate? Yeah, we were increasing the discount rates. And, you know, I think like lots of institutions, yeah. you can't just look at tuition, particularly since there's so much attention uh, to tuition increases that I think a lot of universities and institutions have tried to keep tuition constant. Um, but to meet their revenue needs, they often make adjustment in room and board, for example. And I think uh, many of us saw uh, one of the, the deleterious consequences of the pandemic was the drop off in, in uh, student revenue associated with students not being on campus and not uh, at the dining hall or other kinds of things. So I think the right thing you have to look at is the net student revenue. Very, very important. Uh, tuition and room and board. Uh, that's crucial. Yeah. Um, do you find that uh, when you brought this subject up to your students, alumni, your board, um, how did you make the case for a merger? I mean, that's a, that's a drastic step. How did you uh, right. how did you convince them that this is the way forward? Well, I, I think um, you know we're all educational institutions and. And, and understanding where you are is a learning process for mm. everybody, mm. Uh, and, and including me. Uh, uh, it took me a while to figure out uh, what the trends were and what the implications are for Marlboro. And then we focused a lot of time and intention uh, to get our board to understand uh, the trends across higher ed and particularly how they were affecting Marlboro. And frankly, that's a couple year process, uh, Brian, um, because and I, uh, I mentioned this, that uh, a lot in our community, uh, we've had uh, challenges in the past, and that gives us a false uh, sense that we can claw back from the cliffs, and this time is different, uh, uh, is a harder argument to make that this is, is, is different. And, and frankly, uh, boards of higher ed, um, uh, the people we attract on those boards are uh, often brought on the boards because of their connections uh, to the institutions, their alums, their parents of students, yeah. uh, their neighbors. Uh, they're, they're not necessarily 
uh, brought on boards to deal with existential challenges or, yeah. or, to, or to make really difficult decisions. And, and, and that's one. And the other is the practical. Uh, most college boards uh, meet three or four times a year. You can get them up to speed on understanding where things are, but uh, you have to re-educate them when they come back. And that's just a really time-consuming process, particularly when you don't want to see uh, what the reality is. So, so you know, it, it, uh, and uh, from my first year at, at Marlboro and beginning in 2015, I had uh, each semester a session on our enrollment and uh -huh. our uh, budgets in kind of these open forums. I think those were helpful. Uh, and, and then uh, I think the key thing is uh, nobody wants to believe that your college and, and fundamentally colleges and challenges have three options. They can reinvent themselves uh, through restructuring, uh, uh, reprogramming uh, different modalities of, of program delivery. Uh, they can find a partner, and there are a whole, uh, there are a, a rich menu of, of partnership options out there. Or they can think the unthinkable, and, and nobody wants to think that that they they might close. They will will close. So I think for, for Marlboro, like lots of other institutions, all three options were in play uh, up until the bitter end. Uh, and, and there were some trustees and some community members, uh, alums, emeriti faculty in particular, who believed that, that, that Marlboro could make it on its own. And, and uh, that was really a, a tough uh, belief. And it was based on belief. There was no data or evidence to support it and, and, and in fact uh, when we look at our neighborhood uh, uh, four small colleges in Vermont closed over the last uh, four years and, uh, and I, I, I say for Marble we didn't close uh, we left the campus we took our program and our people our faculty and staff uh, uh, went to Emerson and they're creating something new it's not quite Marble because Emerson uh, is an important part of the process, but they, they're uh, rejuvenating an institute that's been renamed the Marlboro Institute for Liberal Arts and Interdisciplinary Studies. Uh, but you know, this, how do you get people to uh, understand what the reality is really a tough issue, and it's a lot about educating. And, and like uh, that old adage about voting, it has to be early and often. Uh, and, uh, you know, we say about communicating, if you, one thing that is critical, you know, as uh, leaders of institutions, we learn you're supposed to under promise and over deliver. I, I think if your institution in, is challenged, you have to communicate, 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 like they say about real estate, location, location, location. location. You can never communicate enough and there are so many constituents. And, and frankly, many institutions don't have that culture or that capacity to communicate uh, compellingly, clearly, consistently. And that's one thing I would say, you know, if your institution uh, has some challenges, this is one area where you need to devote a lot of resources to. And if you're stretched trying to bring in your class and mm -hmm. raise the funds to narrow your operating deficit, uh, this is one investment that I would encourage institutions to make because there are so many stakeholders who uh, have concerns that need to be addressed. Well, thank you. Thank you. Sure. Uh, friends, this is uh, you, some of your questions have come in and I'm flash them up. So again, if you're new to the forum, just remember the two buttons on the bottom of that white strip, either the raised hand to join us on stage or the question mark to fire up a question. And here's one uh, from uh, David Stone at my alma mater, the University of Michigan. Uh, outside of improving the revenue and enrollment challenges, what key indicators do you see as ways to measure the success of a merger? Also, what yeah. benefits surprised you and what didn't you see that you did okay. expect? All right. So, Brian, will you remind me of the two parts or do I need Absolutely. to take notes? Absolutely. Okay. In fact, I'll yeah, flash so them on the screen again. Parts, that's, that will be great. So, 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 so the first part or, was... Or if you leave it up, that's, that's great. Yeah. What were the key indicators to measure the success? So, uh, uh, David, thank you for the question. I, I'd say the issue, and this is is often lost in the discussion about mergers, is, is it's got to be a focus on the mission. 
So what was your institution's mission? For Marlboro, it was this self-directed, interdisciplinary, uh, student-centric pedagogy. Uh, and, and, um, and we believe, and there's evidence to support it, that that is being embraced at this new institute. So for me, the, the uh, quintessential measure of success is does the, does the mission continue, albeit in a new venue, with other participants beyond your faculty and uh, students? But um, also, uh, the second measure is, uh, does it make it much more sustainable? And uh, for me, uh, the answer is pretty simple. Uh, Emerson has 10 times the financial assets. It's a more selective academic institution. Wow. Uh, and, and, uh, and it's in a, a prime geographic uh, location. So the prospects of sustainability, I think, are, are you know, you pick a, a factor 10 times, 100 times more likely than a uh, rural campus sitting on a hilltop uh, in southern, southern Vermont. But I'd say, you know, I, I, uh, I think also another thing that is key in this whole process is, uh, is what you do valued by your partner. And, and this is often hard to understand that nobody wants somebody unless you bring something valuable to the partnership, to the merger. Some cases it's financial and maybe that's primarily what it is, but it has to go beyond that. Does your potential merger partner, the institution acquiring you, do they really value something beyond your, your endowment? You know, is there a particular program that you have? Is there a technology? Is there a location? Uh, are there a group of faculty that, that can uh, enhance uh, their offerings to, to their students, uh, improve their reputation? So, so those, those are other really important factors. And the second part of the question, uh, David, Brian, if you could put it back up, the cost and benefits. Yeah, it was, it was, a, it was a subtle, uh, subtle que question. What benefits surprised you and what didn't you see that you expected? Yeah. So, so David, thank you. Uh, and I, I'd say, you know, this uh, process is uh, never linear and, um, and um, you often make some false steps along the way. And um, we had a letter of intent with another university that uh, didn't work out. Uh, frankly, I'll be quite candid, it didn't work out because this, and uh, we sent out a prospectus to 77 institutions that uh, we thought could help us with our two fundamental issues, enrollment, and uh, revenue, uh, and and uh, we thought that they'd have some appreciation for what we did at Marlboro, uh, and as a kind of a founding member and one of the few institutions that have been in, uh, has been in the colleges that changed lives community yeah. since Lauren uh, Pope wrote that that classic, and so um, you know that. Uh, uh, it doesn't always work out. Uh, I was anticipating it. It's a lengthy uh, process. Um, I anticipated there'd be a lot of players, um, uh, regulators, legislators, uh, creditors, alumni, neighbors, uh, you know, all of those I anticipated. I didn't anticipate how public the process would be. Mm. And, and despite mm. assurances from our attorney general that mm. our most... Um, confidential and frankly expensive uh, documentation around this process. Uh, the reports from consulting firms, the work by our lawyers, all are now out in the public domain, despite assurances from the Attorney General's office that they would uh, that would not be the case. So how um, much uh, of what you do uh, becomes public uh, you know, I was expecting some, but the degree that it became public uh, surprised me. I wasn't surprised how everybody talked about it, and nobody had, and most of us never do, complete information, but how much of it be, uh, 
uh, got out in the public uh, in, in ways that, that may not be all that helpful. How did it get out? Was it was this a question of leaks, or was the uh... well in in, in, in Vermont uh, it probably has, we have one of the most progressive sunshine uh, acts in the country, and and any document submitted to the uh, office of the attorney general can be requested by members of the public, and and in in a number of cases they're not uh, only members of the public from Vermont, but other parts of the country are were requesting this documentation. Well, thank you. I mean, that's <clears throat> so. First of all, uh, David, thank you for the double header uh, question. <laughs> uh, both both heads of which were very very deep. Um, thank you. Uh, if you're in, and and Kevin, thank you for that very thoughtful uh, voice of experience. Uh, it, again, if you're new friends to the forum, uh, this is the way we work. People get to share questions, and our guests get to wrangle with them. And the wrangling, I'm sure, gives rise to questions for you. You may be curious, for example, about the role of different state sunshine laws, or you may be interested in which stakeholders are most influential. Uh, everything Kevin said is is a goldmine for your next questions. But we have a few other questions that are in the pipeline. Yeah. I want to make sure we can share them. And one comes from Michael Meeks at uh, Louisiana State, who's actually not at Louisiana State. Apparently, that wasn't hot and humid enough for him. He is now in Panama for a sabbatical. So let's give his question a shot. Yeah. Uh, can you please comment on how student revenue and enrollment impact rigor in the classroom or quality of education yeah. as yeah. it's related to mergers? That's great. So, so um, uh, thank you for that question, Michael. And I just, uh, Brian, if, if with your permission, I'd like to say another word about David's um, uh, question. And um, we at Marlboro have a commitment to shared governance that I, I think is unusual. It's it's not only faculty and, and uh, administration and trustees, but it's also students and staff through our town meeting. So we had regular briefings uh, throughout the whole process. We had student and uh, staff and faculty participation on a uh, trustee-led group uh, that was a, a task force on the future of Marlboro. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that was uh, unusual to how participatory we were. And we regularly shared uh, uh, all kinds of documentation with our, our community. And those in turn, um, uh, that information quickly found its way to social media or to the Vermont media that was very interested in that. Yeah. So, so on, on, on the issue of, of, of revenue and, and uh, uh, kind of academic quality, I think that's where it has to start and end. And, and, and in the Marlboro case, uh, we have uh, what we described as a, uh, a radically traditional uh, pedagogy, uh, traditional in that it was based on the so-called Oxbridge model, mm -hmm. seminars and tutorial with outside examination of a capstone body of work before graduation. But, but we described it in a way that just wasn't credible, and I think it uh, affected our quality. Uh, uh, we said, come to Marlboro and you can study anything and everything. And, 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 and frankly, when you're interested in the world of uh, public policy and you don't have an economist to work with, and I'm not to cast asparagus that anybody on this, uh, uh, at, at, in this audience uh, or in this discussion but uh, I think discerning uh, parents and students would say, I'm interested in health policy or environmental policy. Mm. I need to understand something about economics and have a set of quantitative skills. So figuring out how you link what you are, are doing in the classroom to uh, the world of, of uh, meaningful work or shaping lives of purpose. And frankly, at Marlboro, I think we fell short on that. Mm -hmm. So one of the challenges when you're going through a merger is you can't put all your eggs in one basket. So we had a seven part uh, plan called reimagining Marlboro and that started with the curriculum and, and we came up with something uh, we called uh, the Marlboro promise to say every student in Marlboro would learn three things, how to communicate clearly, live in, and, and work in a community of difference 
and lead a big idea from conception to execution. Mm -hmm. And all of those are uh, fungible, are their great life skills, and they're authentic mm -hmm. to Marvel. We did that. But uh, Michael, I think that helped with our quality. Uh, but uh, when I look at the enrollment trends at Marlboro, and they began to decline in 2005, there, those trends uh, accelerated because as uh, parents and students became much more uh, concerned about the cost of higher ed, uh, where it led to, uh, these questions became much more relevant of, of uh, what will I learn, how do I know I've learned it, and what do I do with it? And, and Marlboro was kind of slow in answering that. Now, I think ultimately, and sadly, too late in the process, uh, we were beginning to see an uptick in our revenue, and I think we were having much more credible conversations with uh, prospective students and their families uh, about what you did at Marlboro and kind of the, the value added of a Marlboro education than we were having uh, even three or four years earlier. I, you know, the, I'm sometimes asked about my regret was it's just we didn't have enough time to do that focus on our academic program early enough. And that does take time. Yeah. Um, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Michael, that's a, that's a great question. And, uh, Kevin, what a, what a re revelatory answer. Um, I just want to mention in, in the chat, there have been a couple of, of threads. Uh, one is the question of overbuilding uh, academic capacity or sprawl. Uh, for example, uh, Roxanne Riskin notes that Connecticut has multiple branches and is now in, engaged in a major overhaul with a lot of uh, fusion involved. Um, folks have mentioned too many campuses in New Mexico and California as well. Uh, so that seems to be a theme that's up there. Um, and uh, I want to, Michael asked, an, an, well, actually, there's another question here. Questions are coming in. So again, if you'd like to, just please uh, fire up the question okay. answer box or uh, click the raised hand. You can tell that both Kevin and I are, are pretty kind and nice people. <laughs> so, uh, Most Charles, days. <laughs> yeah, but... Charles Finley from uh, Northeastern always has great questions. He has a very practical and direct one. What happens to student records and transcripts when an institute yeah. closes? Is there great. a central repository? Great. Uh, and, and, and do you want me to start first, Brian, with the question about consolidation on overbuilt and then go on to Charles's? No, no, just, just tack, tackle Charles's first. Okay, great. So, so uh, this, uh, what happens with the transcript is, is uh, a major issue for institutions that have the possibility of closing. And this issue was brought home dramatically in Vermont in the spring of uh, 2016 when Burlington College closed precipitously. The yeah. board met on Saturday and a week later, uh, I think all but uh, five or 10 faculty and staff were gone. There were no provisions for teach out, no provisions uh, in place that were implemented for uh, uh, transfer agreements, no arrangements on transcripts. And this has happened in other uh, states. So uh, the legislators uh, stepped up and, and uh, initially, they wanted every college to post a bond so that if they closed, uh, there would be financial resources to ensure that uh, the firm could be hired to provide the transcripts. But I, I'd, I'd say, uh, Charles, you know, that for me, it, it was uh, taking care of your students and faculty were the, my central concerns. And part of that is, is uh, the transcripts. But more importantly is that students' academic credit be recognized by your partner or the acquiring uh, institution. Uh, and that their uh, fees that they've been paying have been kept, are kept constant to the extent that's possible. At Marble, we were fortunate. Everyone we talked to agreed to accept all of our students' academic credit and to, if they were in good standing and to to keep the fees constant. And there's about a $30,000 a year differential between Emerson and, and Marlboro. But I think it, it goes beyond not just the transcripts, but also thinking about the archives of the institution, you know, your, your history. And, and so uh, Emerson has a lot of it, but uh, uh, we made an arrangement with the University of uh, Vermont to take okay. over our uh, college's archives. But our uh, students' capstone projects 
both in hard copy and digital version, uh, are, are at Emerson. So uh, I'd say yes, uh, you have to, and that's the first question the state regulators asked, is what provisions do you have for your students' transcripts so that uh, they're always accessible? Emerson is handling the Marlboro students' transcripts, but, but we made arrangements to make sure that, that the legacy of Marlboro lived on our archives at the UVM, our uh, students' capstone projects at, at Emerson. Wow. Um, well, Charles, a typically concise and powerful question. And Kevin, I, I love how that, uh, that, that lets you show us the difference between different types of records. Different types of records. Different types of records. Different types of records. You know, the, the themes that are going in the chat, I think, uh, uh, Michael asked a question which sets them up pretty nicely. I want to bring that up on stage. So okay, great. Um, where, where is the future of mergers in the higher ed? I mean, states are cutting budgets. Will that continue? Are taxpayers supportive or even pushing mergers? Yeah. Uh, I, I think, uh, th thank you again, Michael. And uh, I, I think Brian alluded to this in his opening remarks that, that in my view, uh, mergers are, are going to... Uh, continue and in fact the trend will likely accelerate. Uh, I think it's very unlikely that state legislatures, uh, given the pressures on their budget, are going to provide additional uh, support to state institutions. Uh, you know, the trend line is, is uh, going the other way. I think here in Vermont, the University of, of Vermont, our flagship institution receives less than three percent of its budget from the state legislature yeah. where 20 years ago it would have been 40 or 50 percent so so um you know it's that uh, clayton christensen the our architect of that theory around disruptive innovation uh, forecast of 50 percent closure by 2025 i don't think it's going to be quite at that rate but i, I see little reason to believe that this trend will subside and I think uh, the pandemic in some ways uh, has exposed even more the fragility. And, and once the payroll uh, protection plan and other forms of support to higher ed are withdrawn, uh, I think we're gonna see many more uh, institutions exploring these pathways of finding a, 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 a merger partner or be, be acquired or, or hopefully, if they're going to close, do it in a, a, a way that treats its people with dignity, its faculty and students in particular, and, and yep. uh, ensures that the transcripts are accessible to students and the archive, the history of the institutions are preserved in, in a credible facility. I mean, we had proposals that came from small museums in Vermont that wanted our our archives and uh, our alumni pushed very hard for it, but it's like, mm. uh, are those institutions going to be there in 20 or 50 years? Do they have the, yeah. the uh, <laughs> personnel and, and uh, uh. climate controlled uh, conditions that are required to maintain an archives? And, 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 and frankly, um, uh, the question about uh, do taxpayers, are they pushing for mergers? You know, I think taxpayers are, are, are basically, they want to pay less in, in taxes and they're not going to be supportive of, of providing additional state resources to uh, state institutions, particularly if it involves uh, them paying more taxes. So I, I, I think that's very unlikely. And we need to see how the whole movement towards free community colleges, how that, that plays out. But that's going to put... Uh, enormous uh, pressure on other institutions. And that uh, that last point, that's still in the uh, congressional sausage making press right now. Yeah. Yeah. It, it may or may not survive reconciliation bills. We don't know. Yeah. Um, a good question. And uh, I, I and again, another another terrific answer, Kevin. Uh, Thank you. Uh, Vanessa points out, uh, I'll, I'll make a copy of this here, uh, a Forbes article uh, on academic mergers, and I'll just put it there. Vanessa notes that uh, Inside Higher Ed has a mergers tag for their reporting, 
and that there is also a Wikipedia page uh, on academic mergers. Uh, we have another question, um, and different people have asked this, um, including people who couldn't make it today. So I want to make sure that uh, that we get this here. And Michael Meeks uh, asks it very, very uh, cleanly. Uh, what's the difference between a merger and an acquisition? Or yeah. how, do you, how do you keep a merger feeling like an acquisition? Yeah. So, so um, uh, again, another great question. Uh, in, in higher ed circles, most of us use what is a euphemism about partnership as kind of an umbrella term to talk about mergers and acquisitions. Uh, and an acquisition uh, in, in not-for-profit world uh, and, and the business world is when one entity uh, gets controlling interest in the other uh, institution and effectively, that's the end of that second institution. A merger is theoretically between equals. And, and, and if I'm candid here, uh, Marlboro was acquired by Emerson. Mm -hmm. Now, there, there was a significant quid pro quo. We had three strategic objectives. Uh, as I mentioned, taking care of our people. So all of our tenure and tenure track faculty were offered positions at Emerson. And of them, uh, more than 80% accepted uh, those positions. Two, our students had to, had to have all their academic credit accepted and their tuition and fees kept constant. And the third, that there would be an effort to maintain Marlboro's identity, which they did by renaming an institute, the Marlboro Institute. Yeah. So we had some clear objectives there as, as, as part of that process, though, though frankly, an outsider would say uh, Marlboro was acquired by, by um, Emerson. And, and in our community, we talk about uh, partnerships as an umbrella for all of these different kinds of arrangements. But if you look at, you know, what happened at Wheelock and BU, or you look, look at, at Pine Manor and, 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 and uh, BC, or uh, the School of Fine Arts and Tufts, you know, uh -huh. these are mainly New England examples. I think folks in other parts of the world, other countries who have examples, Mills and Northeastern, you know, that's still a work in progress. Uh, what is that going to be? You know, uh, it may. It looks like an acquisition. Uh, will that uh, happen? Um, there are some forces aligned against that, but will they prevail? It's too early to tell. Do you find well? It's a great point. I, I have so many things I don't. I'd like to ask, but I want to make sure that every, everybody else gets a uh, gets it gets a chance. Um, the. Uh, Questions have come up together. I'm going to try and wrap these together into one ball. Um, what's the what's the role of the state government uh, when it comes to mergers? I mean, we, we've seen already yeah. that governments we know yeah. pay less and less, which make mergers more and more likely. But uh, we've seen in the chat people have mentioned that state governments might actually resist mergers, that they would uh, want to keep things going, or that's one political approach. Um, and then we saw Massachusetts actually pass this interesting law, which kind of helped mergers or closures happen by letting the colleges and universities approach the state government quietly, uh, not publicly, so they wouldn't spook people. Um, what, what do you think the role of the government should be? Yeah. So um, it's a really interesting question of, of what is the state government's role uh, in this process around mergers and, 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 and formally, legally, the Department of Ed in each state has to sign off on the mergers or the acquisitions, and their principal interests are around transcripts, or at least in the Vermont case, in Massachusetts case, their concern is uh, around transcripts and and uh, treatment of students, uh, their academic credit, uh, et cetera. Uh, um, the Attorney General's office uh, in each state uh, has a role in uh, approving the transfer of assets. Uh, so yeah. for us, that was, a, I think, probably a 70-plus page document, uh, not only of our, uh, our endowment, 
all the endowed funds, what were their purposes, uh, all the, the uh, our library collections were included that, uh. artwork, et cetera. The uh, attorney general uh, has to sign off on the transfer of those uh, assets to uh, another institution. Now this varies by state. In Vermont, there's a presumption that the assets will be, the transfer will be approved uh, based on, on uh, the institution demonstrating that they've done uh, appropriate fiduciary stewardship and due diligence in, in the process. Now, um, state legislators uh, are uh, strong advocates for the maintenance of state institutions in their home districts. You know, that, that, that those institutions are often the heart and soul of, of a uh, legislative district. They're in many cases the largest uh, or among the top three or four employers. Uh, they're a cultural resource for communities so no legislator wants to have a state institution in its district closed. So they will resist that. Yet simultaneously, that same legislator probably won't vote for an increase in the appropriations to the state institutions. So, so the, the political process, you know, it cuts uh, multiple ways, uh, but uh, a lot of it is, is focused on, on uh, uh, opposition to uh, mergers and consolidation and these state higher ed institutions, the, the opponents of those consolidation are most often the legislators from, from districts that will be adversely affected if their institution closes. And we see that played out in Pennsylvania with a higher ed consolidation plan. We see it in Vermont. Uh -huh. where the chancellor was forced out of in uh, 2019 over yeah. his uh, abortive plans to consolidate uh, uh, the state institutions here. Yeah. Well, there's a lot there. Uh, Elena, yeah. thank you for coming. Uh, please take care. Um, there, there's a lot of moving parts involved in this. Um, I, I do want to uh, uh, ask if, if uh, first of all, for everybody else, uh, we only have a few minutes left, so I want to make sure that you all get a chance uh, to put in your questions, your comments, your thoughts, and reflections. Uh, the forum stands ready for you, so please, uh, you know, this is a place for you to ask your questions. And as you can tell, Kevin uh, takes each question very, very seriously and addresses it uh, with uh, a lot of wisdom. That's been a hard one. Um, you know, looking ahead a bit, uh, thinking about uh, private institutions. Uh, they are, to an extent, um, much more independent of state politics. Um, we anticipate, and, and some of the examples that you've given that we've discussed have been uh, non-public institutions. Uh, in the chat box, for example, um, uh, Rob Gibson mentioned the University of Arkansas system just decided to buy a uh, for-profit uh, online institution at okay, yeah. the University. Uh, yeah. Perhaps the, uh, yeah, for a dollar, for a dollar. Great price. Um, I mean, should we expect uh, more merger activity in the private sector than in the public? Well, I, I, I think we're going to see the merger activities in, in, um, in both uh, spaces, public and private uh, institutions. Uh, and I think you, it, it's pretty easy to say that whatever the proposals are, there's going to be some significant op opposition to it. Um, and this, uh, I think... Uh, goes back to the first question that uh, David asked about what surprised me. And I think when I talk to uh, others who've been through these processes, is how widespread and, um, and deep in some cases the opposition is to partnerships, mergers, acquisitions, uh, often from alumni, uh, but they can be from others, uh, from legislators and, and neighbors who... who uh, 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 resist the change, uh, uh, whatever it might be. So, so I think uh, uh, any leader of an institution that is considering a merger, an acquisition, a partnership, 
you have to anticipate that there be some opposition. And this goes to my earlier point about communicating, kind of knowing who's out there, what their concerns are, uh, finding ways to try and address them candidly, but understanding uh, ultimately some people you just uh, won't persuade. So that's why I say the focus has to be on what is your mission. And if it's no longer viable for your institution to deliver on its mission, uh, then you need to, to find some alternatives. And in the consideration of those other alternatives, there will be uh, various stakeholder groups who are passionate about your institution, have deep ties yeah. uh, to them, highly emotional ties. And, and, uh, it's, uh, and in leadership roles, you become uh, the, the target uh, for that uh, uh, opposition. And in many cases, it veers over to ad hominem attacks and animosity mm -hmm. and a uh, question about credibility and, and competence. Uh, so not for the uh, wary <laughs> of mind, you know, no. if you're thinking about these paths, they are uh, tortuous, but uh, if you keep a focus on, on the mission, I, I can say with great confidence that, that uh, the outcome for Marlboro uh, was far better than any, any other alternative and we looked at, as I said, over 30 other alternatives. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you. Um, we have a question from a, a colleague of mine, uh, John Henry Stites II at Georgetown, who asks a, a kind of meta question or a big macro question. Uh, is there an optimal number of higher educational institutions for the United States? And to get there, how many have to close or merge before we can reach a sustainable level? Yeah. So, you know, it, it, uh, it's a great question. I don't have an optimal number in mind. I, I think the optimal number is having institutions, sufficient number of institutions that provide opportunities uh, to help citizens develop the skills and have the experiences that will lead them to meaningful work and, and lives of, of purpose. You know, uh, I think traditional higher ed has to change. And, and one of the silver linings of pandemic, I've, I've often said that, that the world is, is changing at, at kind of warped speed, but higher ed seems to change at glacial speed. But if you look how quickly higher ed moved online in March of 2020, it is truly remarkable. Yes. And, and my hope is that, that higher ed institutions can repeat that kind of nimbleness. We often talk about being nimble and adaptable. Uh, frankly, we're not as a sector. Mm. We're pretty resistant to, to change. And, and, and so for me, it's really having um, higher ed delivered in all kinds of different ways from all kinds of institutions to a uh, very different than the traditional college age um, uh, profile of student. And, and what that is, you know, I, it's not an infinite number, but it may be larger uh, than our oh. current number of roughly 4,000 higher ed institutions in this country. I think it has to be configured differently and it has to be much more flexible. You know, I think many institutions learn dual degree programs, dual enrollment uh, were yeah. very helpful. Uh, and, but uh, you try and do that in an institution where they're wedded to a five day a week, uh, nine to five or nine to seven calendar, it's pretty difficult. You've got to meet your students where they are. And, and for me, that's going to be what the real determinant is. And, and if we all uh, want to be lifelong learners, just in our country alone, you know, so what do we have? 200 plus uh, million people who are potential uh, students um, and 4,000 uh, may not serve it. it. It may need to be much larger than that, but uh, configured very differently. There's a lot of options there under that configuration. We, we have time for one last question to squeak in under the, uh, under the belt. Uh, and this is again from Charles and another very, very precise question. He's worried about the decline of international students from China. 
who have and will continue to move on to other welcoming countries. So I think this is referring to the rising geopolitical tensions between the United States and China. Well, uh, Charles, that's a great worry to have. And, and, and I, I would say I worry both ways. I think uh, not enough uh, American students go overseas. We know that's a life-changing experience. It's a horizon expanding experience. Uh, yes, uh, this whole field of international uh, students has been politicized, uh, both in our country as well as uh, in China. Uh, I do think there's an enormous uh, appetite for an American-style education, and I've been fortunate over the last three decades to be involved with a number of universities overseas that have an American-style curriculum. Uh, how do we get uh, this field out of politics? Un unfortunately, I think it's very difficult. Uh, uh, speaking of the bilateral relationship with China, I don't see any prospects that, that international student exchange there will be depoliticized. Mm. Are there other markets out there that, that uh, might satisfy some of that need? Yeah, you know, that, that people look at, at uh, some of the, the uh, uh, newly industrialized countries like Brazil and uh, uh, Mexico, uh, Indonesia, India to replace uh, some of those students. Um, that comes with some challenges, uh, too. But I, I think we're falling short in preparing our young people and, and our citizens for the future because uh, they're not enough of them are getting overseas and not long enough duration to really develop the, the language skills, the cross-cultural mm -hmm. competence that uh, we think is going to be essential to their world. Uh, Charles, that's a really solid question. And uh, thank you, Kevin, for the way your answer uh, starts off with um, uh, geopolitics and moves right back to the core curriculum. Um, this is, uh, and unfortunately, we are at the top of the hour once more, uh, which means we need to wrap things up. Uh, Kevin, thank you for sharing well, so far. My, my pleasure. Well, thanks all for this conversation and the opportunity to be with you this afternoon. Oh, it's, uh, it's my pleasure. How can, the, how can people keep up with you if we want to find out uh, what's next with Kevin Quigley? Well, I, I think for me, the easiest is just LinkedIn. I'm glad to, you know, uh, be linked through LinkedIn. Great. Uh, or, you know, my, uh, yeah, that's, uh, I think, probably the easiest way to do that. Excellent. And hopefully I'll, I'll be back here again, uh, Brian, uh, and uh, we'll have that cup of coffee in our neighborhood when we talked about. I would like both of those things very okay. much. In the meantime, take care and good luck. All right. Thanks, all. Everybody take care. Stay safe. Stay safe indeed. But don't go yet. Just want to let you know a couple of things about uh, the next few weeks. Uh, so, again, remember, we've got a whole bunch of sessions coming up on topics from information literacy to scholarship to rethinking teaching to equity. Uh, if you'd like to keep talking about these issues of academic mergers, uh, please, uh, Twitter is a great place for that. Use the hashtag FTDE. You can follow my blog as well. Uh, and if you'd like to go back into the past and look at some of our previous sessions that covered some of these subjects, uh, including mergers as well as public universities, just go to tinyurl.com slash FTF archive. And in the meantime, thank you all for your very thoughtful questions. Uh, this is, I think, a, a very sober, very thoughtful, very experience-based uh, conversation. I'm really delighted that uh, you could all do this together. Uh, in the meantime, to echo our guest, please, everybody, uh, looking forward to seeing you next time. Take care, stay safe, and we'll see you online. Bye-bye. <laughs>